Do you need some more confidence when it comes to pricing your interior design services? Do you even know where to begin? Well, we discuss that and more with one of our favorite guests today on the show, Rebecca Hay. Stay tuned. Hey, kids, and welcome to Designed by Wingna Social. I'm your host, Darla Jethro Powell. And as I am recording this, it is the last day of January 2024. Where is the time going? Is it true that as you get older, time goes faster? Because it is flying. That must mean I'm ancient. (laughs) So I hope you are having a very happy new year and off to a, a terrific start. And today we're talking all about money and pricing and budgeting for your interior design firm. You might be behind the eight ball. You might not be behind the eight ball. You might be a beginning designer or a veteran designer. But today's guest, Rebecca Hay of Rebecca Hay Designs, is uh, going to have some uh, thoughts for us as we have a conversation around money, budgeting, and pricing our services. So we hope you enjoy that. But before I get into my conversation with Rebecca Hay, don't forget, if you head on over to wingnutsocial.com, our course Instagram for interior designers is live and running, and it is a runaway hit. Designers who have taken that course and have implemented it, that's the key, right? You got to implement it if you're going to take a course and do it yourself, have already grown their Instagram, got leads off of Instagram, got clients from Instagram, signing projects, go back and listen to our episode with Ashley Marks of Marks Living Co. Uh, What she did after taking our Instagram for Interior Designers course is uh, nothing less than extraordinary. And you can find out more information about that at wingnutsocial.com. Check out the Wingnut Academy link and get your year started. Even if you're behind, get your marketing started. If you're a beginning interior designer and you can't afford to delegate, marketing done well, marketing done right, which is an investment then get in there, roll up your sleeves, take that course and get it done. Build up, get so busy to where then you can tell us to go ahead and do it for you. <laughs> That's the idea, right? So Rebecca Hay is no stranger to the show. Of course, if you uh, follow us at all, you know that she's brilliant and she has her own podcast, uh, Resilient by Design, that I encourage you to go check out. She is terrific. She is a designer, a speaker, an educator, and brick by brick, Rebecca Hay strategically developed the foundation for her now seamlessly run seven-figure design firm. She tells us a little bit about what she charges, so I do believe that it's a seven-figure design firm. Millions in profits, a savvy team, and countless residential projects later, she now only spends 20 hours a week in her firm. Boy, that's goals. After years of being asked, how did you do it? Today, her mission is to educate fellow design firm owners to build confidence and professionalism in their business through her transformative eight-week course, The Power of Process. And through our conversation, that's not her only course. We have She has several other, which we, of course, refer to here to help you guys with marketing your interior design business. Okay, so without further ado, Wingnuts, help me in welcoming Rebecca Hay back to the show. Hey there, Rebecca. Hey, welcome back to the show. How the hell are you? <laughs> I'm amazing. I love, I just love how you say like, hey there, Rebecca. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> that's my announcer. That's my radio announcer's voice. <laughs> radio announcer's voice. I'm so thrilled to be back here. I love ta- chatting with you. I've had you on my podcast, yeah. I think now a couple of times. I've been here before. I love it. Yeah, I love it. You're always welcome back. And you know, you said something uh, in an email that you would be happy to guest host. And I think I'm going to take you up on that lady. And I have a compliment to give you, by the way. And I've been meaning to tell you this, but I adore, love, am so thrilled with how you show up on your social, your social media marketing. You are putting everyone else to shame, myself included, because yes, you are there, you are present, you're on video, you're, you're, you're killing your marketing. So uh, as a marketer, I would like to say I admire what you're doing. So well done. I'm going to give you a, a oh sitting gosh, ovation. Thank you. I'm blushing. I Ooh, feel so I honored because chair. you're like, <laughs> wow, <laughs> you are like the expert in this area. So that means a lot. It's You know what it is? We go through phases in our life of being on social. And I feel like I'm back in another phase where I'm enjoying it again. And I just want to show up and I want to serve designers and, and just sort of share what's going on in my life. And that the more authentic I feel that I'm being, that's, I think, when it really resonates and when it shows up. And as soon as I start to hold back or I start to be, air quotes, more professional and show up in the way I'm expected to be, um, then I feel like it's not as powerful. So thank you for noticing. You're welcome. And it's not as fun either, right? Well, you know, you don't want to have to think about it too much. You just kind of want to be yourself and, you know, use your knowledge and not have to 
make it ick. <laughs> and you do a great job. I love it. I love watching your stuff. You know, I'm like, wow, this this lady's killing. I don't know where you get the energy. I need to whatever it is that you're taking, eating, drinking, I need like 10 of it because you're just you're you're inspirational. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and you and no. I pee my pants laughing at all the memes that you find and you share. And I showed them to my husband. And I'm like, oh my God, where does she find this stuff? It's so good. Speaking of professional. I love yeah. to laugh. Just, speaking yeah. of professional, I've, I've gone from a, an interior designer to here's a meme today on your on my stories on, on my the Darla Powell account at Instagram. That's not the business account. Yeah, well, but kind you know of what? Is, but it also kind of is. I keep coming back for more. <laughs> You're not alone. I get that a lot from people. They're like, oh my gosh, I come over to the Darla Powell at Instagram, by the way. And uh, look on your stories for memes. It's just ridiculousness. But it's, you know, we all need to laugh sometimes with our coffee. So yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Um, so Rebecca, we are in the first quarter of 2024. And as we're recording this, it's January 31st, right? Yeah, last day of January. Can you believe it? First yeah. of all, and second of all, uh, it's the first quarter, right? So this is the time where we're getting all our budget together, our money's together, we're putting our expenses, what is the year going to look like? We're, we're putting a lot of ducks in a row, taxes and all that stuff. And there are interior designers in the audience, I, I can tell you, I know this is true, um, that are overwhelmed <laughs> with budgeting and the finances for their business. And they're just kind of playing it by ear and taking it day by day. So I'm hoping that you as a world renowned interior design business coach can help give us some structure behind that. And especially what if, you know, what if in January, we just didn't get our ducks in a row and now we're going into February um, and we're catching up. Just, you know what? I just want to hear your thoughts. Where do we start? Where do we dig in? Let's have a conversation about that. Well, first of all, I just want to say you're never too late to the game. Like, okay, you're saying it's February. We're in February now. That's okay. Mm -hmm. It's still early in the year. If you're listening to this, in July, that's okay. You know, if you can spend time focusing on getting yourself up, set up for financial success any time of the year, you are winning because it means that you are really investing in yourself and your business. This is something that I know a lot of design firm owners struggle with in the early years. I know I did. When I started my design business, I had no freaking clue what I was doing. I was Same. just trying to get work, right? Like yeah. I just wanted to, I wanted to make money, I guess, but money was never a driving force for me. It was more, I was the creative. And so I just felt so thrilled and lit up when someone wanted to hire me. And even more so when I made a, rec a design, like any people listening can probably relate to this when I thought, I hope I'm going to put this fabric for it to see if they like it. And they liked it. Like to me, that was all the validation I needed. I just thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But then as the years went on, I mean, I talk about this a lot on my own podcast on Resilient by Design. But in the first few years, like I was ro robbing Peter to pay Paul. Like I did not have money in the bank. I didn't realize that I was collecting tax that I would have to then remit to the government. And I was in the red. I didn't know because no one teaches you these things. Like how many design schools are actually teaching financial literacy in running a design business? Like it's just not, it's not taught. And if it is taught, it's not to the extent that it really should be. And so and a lot of us don't even go to design school. We just, mm -hmm. you know, we have a gift. We have a talent. We worked in corporate. We worked in marketing. We were police officers. You never know where people come from, <laughs> right? And <laughs> yeah. there we are now running a design business. And so just first of all, I just want to say, like, if anybody who's listening feels like behind the eight ball a little bit with understanding the money side of their business, like you're not alone and it's yeah. always about progress over perfection. So that's where we start is just recognizing that it's okay to not know your stuff. Um, but what matters is that you want to start paying attention to the money. Yeah, you know, and I think that's true because I went into it too as a creative and a way to get away from a, a profession that I wasn't really that thrilled about and still work and make a living. But it was I wasn't really I had no idea what I didn't know, going into the business side and the money side and the budgeting side. And I've learned so much since then, especially running a, you know, an interior design business that's so complicated. And then now a marketing agency, with help from professionals like yourself, of course. So where do, where do we begin to what what things are we looking at to make sure that we have a grip on I imagine the biggest, you know, elephant in the room is, are, am I in the black? Am I in the red? Am I, you know, am I having to borrow, like you were saying, do, is there money in the bank, right? But I, I know it's more complicated than that. Of course it is. Well, I mean, honestly, I think the first place to start and 
I just did a training on this inside designers room, which is my, my membership for designers. It was our December sure. call where we talked about goal setting. And I talked about like, you know, what you need to do to sort of financially forecast. But I think the first thing that you need to do is you need to look at your numbers. Like you need mm-hmm. to look at if you have any historical data, if you have been in business for more than a day, you need to look at what you did. How much money did you bring in? What was your top line revenue? Like how much was that gross? They call it gross. The only way I remember that is like gross is like disgusting. It's so much money, right? Oh my God. Or it may not be, but that's, I'm just trying to like help the people who are not mathematically inclined like me to understand that term. Gross revenue is like everything that comes in top line. How much did you bring into your company? And then once you know that, and I know this sounds so simplistic, but the reason yeah. I start here is because I didn't even do this in the book in the early years. Like I really mm-hmm. had no freaking clue. I was just like, great. I got a check for 10,000. Cool. I got a check for 2000. I'm raking in the dough. I never looked mm-hmm. at my bank account at the end of the year. I just send the receipts to the accountant and he would say, oh, you made this much money. I was like, oh, I did. Like I was <laughs> totally in the dark. <laughs> so you, you know, need to I, first I think look that's at okay. your revenue. I think that's okay, Rebecca, to be simplistic because I think that uh, you're not alone. You know, it, there's there are members in the audience or listeners in the audience who are at that spot who maybe are a little embarrassed to admit it or maybe even to themselves. So I, I think this is going to resonate with more people than we care to admit. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of shame around money. And I say that only from personal experience because I'm not someone Mm -hmm. who ever felt strong in math. I actually was the only the only high school student in my high school who went to my guidance counselor and got a a pass on. I think it was like grade 11 math. I was like, I don't need math. I'm an artist. I'm not going to need math like the balls. Right. And they were like, okay. (laughs) And I didn't do the rest of the math courses. I never did calculus. I never did algebra. I just didn't do the math. I was convinced that I was terrible at it. And jokes on me, because as a designer, you need to know a lot about math and fractions. The Canadian school system, (laughs) ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Stay south of the border. (laughs) All right. So I I cut you off. So you're talking about uh, we're, we're being very simple and we're looking at just even just for the very basic, just know how much money you grossed. Ooh, yeah. Gross. Yeah. Look at Mm -hmm. how much money you brought in. Ooh, gross. But don't look at it that way. It should be yay. Oh, it's such a gross amount. I can't believe it. And then you (laughs) need to look at what your expenses were. And this is Mm -hmm. something that a lot of us are afraid. And we were mentioning shame around money. Like a lot of designers, and I know I sort of felt like, well, I don't think I'm smart enough to understand it. So I would avoid looking at it. And it was yeah. almost like, if I don't look at it, then it, it's not a problem. Or I was afraid that if I looked at it, it was going to be worse than I thought. And whatever your mindset is around money, and that's like a whole other conversation, you need to know your numbers. And in a second, I want to get to like what our clients are expecting of us, but Mm -hmm. you need to look at what it costs for you to run your business. And I know that I've had to have hard conversations with myself and sometimes my team over the past few years where I'm, my, my expenses started to escalate. Because as you start to get busier as a firm owner, I'm sure you can relate to this. You're like, oh, I need help. I'm going to hire a social media manager. I'm going to hire a junior designer. I probably also need an intermediate designer. I should Maybe I should put them on payroll. And before I knew it, my expenses were escalating, escalating, escalating. And I was paying out 40,000 plus a month in expenses in my business. So you need to look at what your expenses were from in the historical data you have. If you have an entire year in business, that would be a really great place to start and look at it and then start start to break it down by month. Because once you know what it costs for you to run your business, that's when you can start to set goals for the year ahead. Do you want to break even this year? Are you going to reduce mm-hmm. your expenses? Or do you want to make a little bit more profit? And when I say look at your expenses, I want you to include how much you pay yourself. Because you need to consider yourself an employee of your business, whether you're on a payroll salaried position or not, you might just transfer yourself money as you need it as like a shareholder um, draw, like a dividend, whatever it is, you need to include that because you want to make sure you're paying yourself enough. You can't Mm -hmm. be just whatever the profit is in the business. And I, I, it took me a while to figure that out. I would just kind of draw money as I needed it. And I was like, Oh, good. There's still money in the bank. Yay. (laughs) <laughs> Let me ask you a question on, on that, on that paying yourself, right? As part of budgeting, is there a hard and fast rule with, let's say you, you're looking at your gross, you're subtracting your exp- 
expenses on a percentage of what's left as to what you should be paying yourself? Or what is that goal? What are what are interior designers shooting for to be paying themselves? Is there a formula? I don't have a formula. I think it's different okay. for everyone. Okay. I think everyone has a different idea of how much money they should or need to make. I know some I need to designers, make a million dollars a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, pay yourself personally or gross revenue. Like those are two different things. Um, I know some designers who don't want to hire and they just want to keep all the profit for themselves. So they're gearing up to pay themselves a lot more, but then they also mm -hmm. have to do more work. Whereas I know yeah. other design firms who say, you know, I'd rather have the time freedom I will pay more people. And that's been me. Like you raise your hand. That's I'm raising too. my hand. That's been me. Yeah. I'm like, as long as I can pay myself whatever standard amount for now, I want to keep growing my business. And that's yep. where I don't think there is a formula to follow. Um, but you can figure out, and this is something that it took me a really, really long time to do. If you look at your personal expenses, and maybe people listening to this are like, obviously I do this, Rebecca. Well, I did not for like good 13 years <laughs> of running a business. Um, You're not alone. How much do I need to live? Like mm -hmm. literally how yeah. much money? And again, this might sound simplistic to some people, but for me, when I heard this for the first time, it was a massive aha. Like, oh, I don't know. How much am I paying in childcare? How much am I paying in food? How much is my mortgage every year? Like, I don't know, it just comes out of my bank account. As long as I have money in there, I'm good. And so once you figure out what it costs for you to have the lifestyle that you have now, you know that's your bare minimum. So if you right. need to pay yourself $30,000 or $200,000, that is dependent on your level of lifestyle. And you need to know what that minimum is. And then do you want to give yourself a raise? Okay, so that means that our goals for this year are going to be that much greater. But you need to know how much you want to pay yourself so that you can start to plan and look at, okay, how many jobs am I actually going to need? Or mm. how many, you know, expenses do I need to cut? Right. Do you have your budget for the year or do you recommend interior designers? Do you have them broken down into categories with percentages? Um, that's a good question. I don't... <sighs> What I typically do is I, I look at past years. So I will look at last year's budget, all my expenses, and then I'll sift through and say, okay, wow, I can't believe we spent $10,000, let's say, on software as a service. Yeah. Let's set a goal for next year to reduce that. So next year, can we try and get it to $8,000, let's say? Um, that's sort of how I do it now. I look at what I've done and what I, because mm -hmm. I think it's hard to set a budget with no historical data. Otherwise, you're just making numbers up. Yeah, right, right, right. Because like, for example, like I know for marketing, for so digital marketing or marketing in general, the rule of thumb is uh, experts have said anywhere from 5% uh, of your gross to f Luan Nigera, 15 to uh, sometimes even 20% of your gross. You know, Luann Nogueira of a well-designed business podcast, window works and all that. Um, Kate O'Hara from Martha O'Hara Interiors has said at the minimum for your marketing budget, like if you're a million dollar firm, $50,000 of that is going into marketing. Mm -hmm. But that's where you're up to, you know, so what, that's what I'm saying is, are we breaking down oh, if you're making a million dollars just for round numbers, X amount of percent, 65% of that needs to be payroll, you know, 15 mm -hmm. marketing, such such taxes, that kind of thing. Like to for a structure, even if you're a beginning designer and maybe you made 50,000 or a hundred thousand, is there, is, does that scale down, you know, doing a percentage or how does someone even dig into that to say, okay, this gives me a little bit of a framework to shoot for if they don't have the history, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say they're breaking even or making a profit. So I'm trying to like see if there's some kind of structure there that they can I wrap mean, their heads around. I struggle with this um, just on like a, a, a level of, Every business is so unique and so different. And I work with a lot of interior design firm owners inside my community. And I see so many different ways of doing things. I see different people being successful with very different models. And so that's where like, I don't have a formula. I know there's, I, I have heard that before, like 20% of your marketing of your budget should go to marketing. Um, and I think these formulas come from larger companies where they've start to run things, they've tested the waters, they are well-oiled machines. And I think that's a nice number to strive for. But somebody who's just starting out may not, 20% to spend on marketing might be a little bit crazy. And maybe they need to spend time instead in networking as opposed to dollars on marketing.
you just launched your business on September the 1st. Yes. So yep. tell me how the, the Instagram for Designers course has helped you with that and what kind of ROI you've, you've received from that already, because I, I think it's pretty pretty big, right? It is. Yep. And I've had really great engagement since um, launching my page. And I've had a ton of leads come in and I've landed some pretty big projects for spring of 2024. And wow. I really don't think I would be here today if I didn't take this course. Wow. Yeah. That is in, yeah. That's insane. That is incredible. How many leads are you getting from Instagram? How, how is, you know, what does that look like for you on a weekly or monthly basis? One to two per week. Every single one of my leads have come from Instagram. There's so many things that I wouldn't have known to, you know, improve my search engine optimization on, on Instagram. You know, what's the, you know, what's so funny with that, with the marketing is it's counterintuitive uh, is that when you're first starting out, it's really a higher percentage <laughs> of your budget goes mm. to marketing so you can be discovered and be successful. And then once you've ramped up, you can pull that back a little bit and, you know, with your reach and awareness, which isn't necessarily um, a hard and fast rule. But yeah. it's because when you're first starting out, you it, how are people going to find out about you? But to your point, that's with the network getting it, networking and everything, too. That's that's a terrific point. Yeah. And I, I've heard some people say like 20 percent profit margin is a good, healthy mm -hmm. profit margin sure. starting out as an yeah. interior design firm. But then again, there there's the people in the first couple of years, like they're not making a profit because they just want to get their mm -hmm. name out, like to your point. Exactly. That's that's how I was with Darla Powell Interiors. We were breaking even, maybe even in the red the first year a little bit because I was hiring, I was delegating. I didn't really care so much about making. I got a pension from the police department. I mean, I made some. Um, it wasn't like when I was into my, my second or third year, I was really starting you know, sell furnishings and start making the profit and everything. And then, of course, we had a divorce and now at Wingnut, um, my CFO, and we're profitable now at Wingnut, my CFO was like, you know, businesses sometimes take five or six years and just break even, break even as they're growing and scaling. So maybe not for the solopreneur so much, because like you said, there's less to pay, less to scale. Mm -hmm. So which brings me to my next question. So you have a group, Designers Room, right, where you go in and you do consult with interior designers. Designers, and I, want, I do want to talk to you about that a little bit more. But you just said that you see different business models, and different business models are working for different people. What would you say are the the different types of business models? Maybe someone listening there could say, "Oh, yeah, that that seems like that resonates more with how I'd like to work," or that you've seen be successful from a you know a financial structural kind of view. Yeah, I mean that's a really great question. I've I always say there's no one size fits all to running a design business. Sure. Um, you know, I know there are coaches out there that say like follow my like you know ten step project management system or <laughs> do it this way and you know make sure you pass on your discounts. Like, well, first of all, I don't agree with that, but I I do yeah. believe that you have to find what works for you and what resonates. So here's some examples some examples of what I've seen. There are some designers okay. that are full service. They do the design from start to finish. They purchase and supply all the products for their clients. And so they are squeezing out as much profit as they can, but then they also need to invest in their people and their team to deliver on a high, le a high service uh, level. Mm -hmm. Also, you often need to have multiple projects at the same time. Um, as you're building until you can get to a point where maybe you have one project that is the big, big kahuna um, to sort of support you. But ultimately, yeah. there's that full service design model where you are making profit from your product. And that does take a team. No, it, it does take a team. But, you know, I have seen solopreneurs who are doing that by themselves, but it, not for long. Not for long. And honestly, to mm -hmm. be to be completely honest, the people that I see doing it burn out um, yeah, quick. because it's it's too many pokers in the fire to stay on mm -hmm. top of placing all of the orders and everything that goes into placing orders and dealing with back orders, dealing with damage, dealing with yada, yada, yada. There's the client service part. Like, I don't have to go into all of that. You guys know that. Yeah, there sure. are other businesses, though, that really sustain their revenue on consultations only. And that's how they make their money and they don't want to hire people. They just want to go show up, bring their expertise, make money for their time. And they have practically no expense. They would probably have a marketing expense category um, mm -hmm. and like a website, but it's pretty low. There's also a cap at how much money you can make in that model. You'd have to start charging a lot for those consultations. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's something that you can make a living on for sure. And I will say I've done that. Like I've just done paid consultations. And even though it wasn't the big, you know, fifty, hundred, two hundred thousand dollar job that I wanted, there was a sense of relief <laughs> sometimes that I just got paid for my hour, my two hours, and I was done. Totally. I didn't have the headaches of it. It was just quick cash, quick income. And I do know that there are interior designers who just do that. Just do consulting and you don't have to worry with the the contractors, the headaches, the, you know all of the stuff like you would before you just here you go here's my ideas here's some de- here's some deliverables go shopping goodbye <laughs> yeah like you don't have to deal with the headaches you just go in show mm-hmm. up do your beautiful thing but in my experience you do need mm-hmm. more projects that way so like yeah. there's designers that will just do the design and then they don't they're like they hand it off so they might say okay it's a fixed fee we're going to design everything we're going to do your drawings for you we're going to select mm-hmm. all of the tile we're going to send you a list here's your drawing package you're off to the races. You work with your contractor. Um, and it can I be really a appealing. happy medium. It that is a happy medium, I think, right there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even entertained that myself at one point. But then when I really crunched the numbers, I realized that I made more money by purchasing product for my clients. Yeah. And if I yeah, only 100%. did design, I need more, more clients a year uh, to make up that revenue. And so that's where it's like constantly looking at like what revenue stream works for you. But above all else, honestly, Darla, and this is maybe my my thing for this year is like what actually lights you up? Because if you are mm-hmm. excited about what you do and your offer, you will be more successful. You just will because you're going to put in, you're going to push yourself that extra mile. You're going to like really get excited. It's going to come across to your clients, to the team that you start to grow. Um, and so it's really understanding what sort of business model works for you. But then coming back to the expenses part, you really do need to look at how much money you bring in, what those expenses are. And then you need to look at, and this is sort of the next step. If you're going to plan, because we're in February and we're planning our year ahead is mm-hmm. okay. If I want to bring in $100,000 top line gross revenue this year, I'm just picking 100,000 because it's an easy number to calculate. How many projects do I need to secure at what value? And so you could say, oh, okay, well, if I want to bring in $100,000, I need four projects that are valued at $25,000 each. Mm -hmm. Or I want to bring in two $25,000 projects and uh, then I might bring in like a bunch more small ones. And mm-hmm. what I like about that is it really starts to make you realize what you need to actively go after in your marketing, right? To mm-hmm. actually achieve that goal instead of just hoping and wishing that the next great project is going to come your way. So let, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about when, when we're figuring out, okay, we, you know, we want to do 2 million or a million or a hundred thousand, whatever the case may be. We, we need to sign 10 more clients or this many more projects. or we need this. What are you saying to the designer who is looking at their year and like, oh my gosh, I, I lost money or I would need, I would just, I can't in order to make a hundred thousand, I would have to have, you know, too many projects and there's just not that much of me to go around. So then we're looking at their pricing, mm-hmm. right? So when we're looking at that and we're breaking that down, where do you begin to start looking at pricing their, pro- your projects to a, a, place to where you're not going to burn out, you're not losing money, you know, and you can realistically sign those four projects to make the hundred thousand or the million or, or whatever that is. How, how do we even begin to look at that? And I know you have a, a course pricing with confidence mm-hmm. <laughs> that we can do a deeper dive. You know, you can tell us more about as well, but, but where do we start with that with interior designers? Cause it does tie back into the budgeting, as you're saying, to forecast what we totally. need to do to make our goal. Yeah. And the biggest question, and I'm sure you get this, but the biggest question I get from designers is how do I calculate mm-hmm. my design fee? How much exactly. do I charge yeah, for my that's services? That's the biggest one I see every day, all day yep. long in all the groups. How much would you, I have this project. How much would you guys charge for this? I see that yep. everywhere. Totally. And even in my marketing groups, how much would you charge for it? It's the number one thing I think that designers struggle with the most. Yeah. And that's honestly why I love this. I love having these conversations. Mm-hmm. That's why I love podcasting. That's why I love my designers room community, because the more we share with each other, the actual cost of things and what people are actually mm-hmm. charging, the more we can start to make decisions for ourselves and not make decisions blindly. But to answer your question, that's sort of where I'm getting at with understanding how many projects do I need to bring in? You might say, oh, wow, I only wanted four projects this year, but I need them to each bring in 200, sorry, 
$25,000 or $250,000 or whatever it is, Mm -hmm. that's when you need to decide, okay, am I charging enough money? And probably you're not Mm -hmm. because most design firms and designers and creatives are not charging enough money for their services. And so, I mean, that's what I dive into in pricing with confidence. I walk through the, what I see as three different business pricing models in the industry. Mm -hmm. This is what I've seen from my own experience with my colleagues and with the industry now with this thousands of designers I've been exposed to is there's essentially three. There's hourly pricing, there's fixed fee or flat fee pricing, and then there's hybrid. And the reason I grouped it that way is because the hybrid could be maybe part of your service is fixed and the other part is hourly, or maybe it's different phases that are all fixed, but you calculate it a different way. I always recommend for designers to start out when you're really starting, just start with billing hourly until you understand how much time it takes you. Because the thing, the the biggest misconception about fixed fee pricing is that, because I did this, (laughs) oh, thank God, I don't have to, I don't (laughs) have to track my hours. (laughs) Yes, right? (laughs) Oh, thank God, I don't have to track my hours. I'm just going to charge a flat fee Wow, this is, and at first I did that. I'm like, oh, this is so freeing. This is amazing. Of course I'd be making money. <laughs> and then, you know, two years in, I looked back, I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. Mm-hmm. If I had charged hourly, this is how much I would have made. So you have to track your hours regardless. <laughs> yeah. That's my lesson to everybody here today. Um, mm. But you do need to understand how you're going to calculate your design fee. And I think just coming up with a number out of the top of your head might work for some people. Um, but in general, I feel more confident when I have a formula. And so in my course, I walk through the different formulas that are common. But what I would say, you have to decide what works for you, trial Mm -hmm. it and error it, right? So like you're going to try square foot pricing, for example, right? Okay, I'm going to let's say some designers might say I'm going to charge $10 a square foot uh, for a kitchen design. Great. Okay, do it. But when it's over, you need to look back and see if it really was a good price for that project and compare it to your hours, which is why in that course, I have actually um, a design fee calculator. It's an Excel spreadsheet template that you can use to plug in Mm -hmm. and you can compare the different models and, and you need to look at it with every project and see like, did that work? Okay. Maybe I need to be actually charging hourly because we're just not, making enough money charging a fixed fee and I get too much sticker shock telling my client mm-hmm. up front, it's going to be $50,000, but yeah, I could collect that over a period of time. And again, this is going to come down to what works for you, but in order to calculate your pricing, you do need to track your hours uh, and you do need to understand fully what's involved in a project. And that's why I always say start hourly. If you've never done a project before, mm-hmm. I highly recommend you work hourly and you don't tell, you can't commit to how many hours it's going to take because you don't know. When I first started interior design, I did a flat rate and I lost my, it's like I way undercharged. Like I had no idea. Right. And then we went to hourly and then I was a little intimidated by that. And then I went to the hybrid model, which did, did seem to work really well. I did like a flat, f- flat rate for the initial design and then hourly for project management or, at, you know, because you never know things pop mm-hmm. up for project management. And I think that that worked out really well <clears throat> for yeah. us because I mean, there was one time my designer and I, we spent like eight hours sourcing a rug. We're not charging for that <laughs> just because we're having a bad day. So, you know, it offsets. And then another day, you you know, 10 minutes to find a lamp, you know. Um, but yeah, but that seemed to work out really well. And we, when I first started out, I think I was charging like 50 or 75 bucks an hour. And it went to like 200, $250 an hour by the time I retired from that to do Wingnut. But that was trial and error. So um you, you mentioned in your course that you do have some different examples. Can you share one of those formulas with us or one, what one absolutely. of those looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, one of them would be a square footage model. So, and, right. and okay. I, I give a range because it really does depend on the size and the scope mm-hmm. of a project. And I, what, I, sure. what I say to designers in the course is it's really important. And I mentioned this earlier in our chat today. It's really important that you're communicating to your clients when you first talk with them about how, you don't have to tell them how you calculate your fee. But how, how, like what to expect as far as fees, like they're coming to you, you're the professional, you need to know your numbers. Um, Mm -hmm. You need to know project costs, but you also need to know an idea of what your fees are going to be. And so the, the um, square footage price, the model is, and it could start from $10 and go up to $35. 
You know, I've mm-hmm. done this from $16 to $25 and now we're, we're getting up higher at the 30 to $35. But basically mm-hmm. let's say you pick $20, uh, a square foot for the spaces that you're designing. And so you go okay. through and, you know, what we do in our design firm is we have all the rooms listed. We measure when we're at the consultation, we measure all the rooms. We do overall measurements, not detail, just overall. And we come up with, okay, so the areas that we are being contracted to design are 1,500 square feet. I multiply that by 20. Mm-hmm. Then I say, huh, okay, well, the last time I charged that fee, it was for a smaller scope, or maybe it was for a bigger scope. Maybe I should charge $19 a square foot. This is where I say there's no hard and fast rule. I don't want to tell designers, sure. charge $20 a square foot. It may not be enough for you. It might be too little for you. What are your expenses, mm-hmm. right? What? How many yeah. years in the business are you? You need to start somewhere though. And so that's why I created that course. So you can start to see how others are charging and then you can measure yourself against it. You might say, okay, Rebecca's charging $30 a square foot just to design. That's not even for implementation. Like I, the implementation is a separate fee for us. And so that might be, someone might see that and say, okay, well, if she's charging $30,000 for that type of reno, I can at least charge 10. And that's just design fee. That's just design design fee. fee That includes. Nice. Good job. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you. I I love it. Well, you know, Rebecca, of course I could talk to you about the business of interior design and budgeting and money it all day long. Um, but but we don't we have are, all day. Have, <laughs> I have a sales call in 15 minutes. <laughs> so before before we get into the what up wing round, let's, let's so your you have your designer's room. Tell us a little bit about that. And then the pricing with confidence. Yes. Yeah. So designer's room is brand new to the industry. I okay. like to say it's the like interior design industry's best kept secret until now because I've had it <laughs> for the past 2 years but it's only been for students of my courses. Now I'm bringing it forward and anyone in the interior design industry is welcome to join. It is a annual membership. We meet on Zoom. There's an incredible portal where you can search using AI. You can search whatever you're looking for. It's going to bring you to the timestamp and whatever training I talked about that thing. So pricing your services, for example, Um, it's a beautiful community with like-minded designers. And that's where we can really support each other and ask those questions. Like you just asked me, like, how much are you charging for a kitchen reno? Sure. And you can see other designers, what they're charging. And it's like a little like think tank mastermind group as well as your coaching. Totally, in totally. That. that that sounds amazing. And we bring on experts like you. You're going to be there. I'm going to get you in there. <laughs> Yay. Marketing experts. And then, of course, you have your course, of course, of course, pricing with confidence. I think that, that we need to tell the listeners about that, because I think this, like we said, this is the biggest sticking point and they need to get they need to know they need a framework. Yeah. Right? So th- that came about because people kept asking, 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 asking. I was like, fine, I'll do a course sure. on this. And it it has been like a top seller. Essentially, it is a bite-sized course. It is like a mini course that you can consume in one afternoon in your own time. Mm-hmm. It is the blueprint to calculating your interior design fee with ease so that you can confidently price every project. I walk you through the different it. models. I show you examples of what I do, what other designers have done. And I've had some incredible feedback. People immediately take that course and immediately start charging more money for their services. Like hands down, yeah. take that course. It's not expensive um, just to even lay that groundwork so you know what other people in the industry are charging. Where do where do we go to find these? You could just go to RebeccaHay.com uh, forward slash pricing for the pricing course. Okay. Um, okay. But everything you want, everything you want to learn is on RebeccaHay.com. <laughs> all the things. All right, RebeccaHay.com. And of course, that will all be in the show notes at wingnetsocial.com for this episode. Rebecca Hay, thank you so much. Now I have to ask you, are you ready for the What Up Wingnet round? Do, 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 do. Always born ready. <laughs> so you've been through this once or twice, right? So we have some new questions for you. So my first one, these are new, but also old. But if you're a long time listener in the show, you'll, you'll, you'll recognize some of these. If you were tree, what kind of tree would you be? Hands down, a maple tree. Very nice. I'm Canadian and they're sweet, right? Maple syrup. Oh, yeah, just like you. If you could have only one superpower, what would it be and why? This is the hard one. I don't actually know. <laughs> Fly? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fly? That's cool. Why? Sure. I, Think about it. It's okay. I like to travel. I really like to be in different places. And I, I don't know. I love the nature and I don't know. I just, sure, flying. And last but not least, please recommend a book that's impacted you either personally or professionally. 
Okay, so I recently read my first fiction book in over a decade. It's called Meet Me at the Lake. It's by Canadian author Carly Fortune. Carly is C-A-R-L-E-Y. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. it was about like Ontario cottage country at the lake. I grew up, you know, going to cottages, spending my summers on the lake. It is a romance, which I've never really read in my life. And my <laughs> goodness, can I just tell you, Darla, it was so refreshing to read something. And it was like, there's some spicy scenes in there too, which I loved. And uh, Did it have Fabio on the cover? No, it just has a lake. It's very, <laughs> a, very unassuming actually. Um, but it's a nice break from all the business books that I typically read and I typically recommend. So if you're looking to like, just get a break from reality, uh, meet me at the lake. So good. Our brains need that. We need a little bit of a break sometimes so we can just kind of regroup and reset. I love that. Meet me at the lake by Carly Fortune. For Kylie Ford, with yeah. Fabio on the cover. <laughs> it's a pink cover. I bought it at the airport, to be honest. <laughs> I'm like, that looks good. <laughs> uh, well, what a lucky find. Well, Rebecca, hey, thank you again for joining us. Um, please tell the wingnuts again where they can go to find out more about you and we'll call it a day. Well, if you'd like to listen to this podcast, come on over and listen to my podcast, Resilient by Design. And otherwise, uh, you can find me, RebeccaHay.com or on Instagram on Oh, Instagram, which apparently I'm active on, uh, according to Darla. So Rebecca Hay Designs <laughs> on Instagram. Come say hi. Oh, that's right. Did you start taking the Instagram for interior designers course yet, lady? I started, but I got so <laughs> busy. I know because I want to talk about it, but I'm not going to be inauthentic. I'm going to take it. And as I go through it, I'm going to share with my audience on Instagram. So keep following me. I'm going to tell you all about it. I know it's going to be good. <laughs> uh, all right, Rebecca, it's always a pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you, Darla. All right, kids. So, you know, I wish at the end of the day that we could say, here is the exact formula, one size fits all to go out and make your business profitable. You need to make this much in furniture sales, this much, this is what you want to spend in marketing. You need to make this much year as, a, as an interior designer. And so it is a little bit different for everybody. I mean, obviously, at the end of the day, you want to, you know, 20 to 30% profit margin is a pretty good rule of thumb. Like we said, fit, you know, 10 to 20% marketing budget. But if you're not in those places, you're not in those places yet. So you need to learn how to navigate those waters to grow and to become profitable where you're at, right? And the one good way to do that is to actually get in there, not be afraid and take a look of where you've been, what you've been charging, how much money you've made, what your expenses are. Are you spending way too much on action figures for your home office? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, not, not mentioning any names, but that could be me. I'm throwing, I'm throwing myself under the bus there. Anyway, you know what I mean? So I highly recommend you head on over to RebeccaHay.com and check out her pricing with confidence course or check out what the designer's room, right? Where you can talk to fellow interior designers, talk to Rebecca and say, Hey, this is me. This I'm Susan McNuggets. Here's my situation. Here's what brings me joy. Here's what I'm charging. Help. Help me get organized around that. In my career, I have found the best improvement, best progress, the most rewarding results from peers, talking with my peers, with a coach, with masterminds, and and just really kind of learning what other people are doing. And when you're in a protected environment like that, because it's not free, right? This this group, there is a, a cost, there's a barrier to entry with a cost there. It's, it's no, no one blowing smoke or protecting themselves. They are paying money. They're all there to learn. They're all there to share. It's a confidential mastermind. And in my experience, those have been the best ways to help grow my mindset and my way of thinking and learning what it is and how it is to run a business uh, successfully and profitably. So that's RebeccaHay.com. Don't forget to go check that out. Again, wingnutsocial.com. We are a digital marketing agency. We specialize in social media marketing for interior designers to the trade manufacturers. We have furnishings company, window treatment company, rug manufacturers, uh, interior designers, architects. That's what we do. That's all we do. That's our milieu. That's our genre. I am a former interior designer. I guess I kind of still am. Decorator, interior decorator, semantics. I know. From Miami, Florida. And ran a successful interior design firm, marketed it, and got published, got all kinds of press, got all kinds of stuff for my uh, interior design business straight out the bat. And then that's what grew to my marketing chops for Wingnut Social, and that's why we were born. Because I tried marketing my interior design firm with just any agency, figuring, hey, it's marketing. How, what could go wrong? A lot. 
a lot went wrong. There's a lot to know about the workings, inner workings of an interior design business, that business model, what our workflow looks like, how we speak to clients, prospective clients, that funnel, what that looks like to bring them in. We've done that. That's all we do. And that's what I did. And that's why we exist. It's wingnetsocial.com. Happy to chat and see how we can work together. And remember, until next time, to get out there, get uncomfortable, and be great. Do you need some more confidence when it comes to pricing your interior design services? Do you even know what to price? Uh, hold on. She is a designer, a speaker, and an educator. Brick by bick. Brick by bick. <laughs> she does. She has uh, uh, aspects and different things that go into what's going to make your firm a profitable. Prop, uh.